Lord Jesus, we just thank you for what we read in John 4. Lord, you sat down with that lady at the well who had no hope and no life left in her, Lord. We just, and we thank you, gave her life. And Lord, we just thank you for the effect that had to all her neighbours. And Lord, we just lift all these people up to you. Please come and talk with them this year, Lord. Thank you, you chose exactly the right moment to speak with that lady. And we just ask, Lord, you would do it for our family, our friends, our neighbours, whoever it is, Lord. Please speak. Please save, we pray. Amen. Okay, we'll uh, come back together ready to sing. This morning we saw, wasn't it, it's with God's mercy in view in Romans chapter 12 that we need to be devoted to, to each other, seeing that God hasn't treated us like we deserve, but he's had so much kindness and grace on us in Jesus. And um, this song is just reminding us to start off with tonight how huge God's mercy is. help us to keep your mercy in our view all the time Lord we're here because you have not treated us like we deserve we're so blessed because you've had mercy on us Lord we are, have life in Jesus because you've had mercy on us Lord thank you your mercy is so much more and we just pray Lord you carry on helping us this evening amen so we're going to carry on singing and just lifting our eyes up to where Jesus is Seated, there is a higher throne.
Father, again, we just thank you. We have such a hope in Jesus. Thank you that if we've trusted in him, our sins are forgiven. Lord, and we can know that this evening. We just ask, Lord, you would speak to us now through your word for your glory's sake. Amen. Okay, please be seated. I believe Judy's coming. Brilliant. Thank you, Judy. Hello everyone. So the reading is from 2 Chronicles, chapter 12, 1 till the end. And in the Church Bibles it's page 315. So 2 Chronicles, chapter 12, 1 till the end. After Rehoboam's position as king was established and he became strong, he and all Israel with him abandoned the law of the Lord. Because they had been unfaithful to the Lord, Shishkak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, with 1,200 chariots and 60,000 horsemen and the the innumerable troops of Libyans, Succites and Cushites that came with him from Egypt. He captured the fortified cities of Judah and came as far as Jerusalem. Then the prophet Shemaiah came to Rehoboam and to the leaders of Judah, who had assembled in Jerusalem for fear of Shishak. And he said to them, this is what the Lord says, you have abandoned me, therefore I now abandon you to Shishak. The leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, the Lord is just. When the Lord saw that they had humbled themselves, this word of the Lord came to Shemaiah. Since they have humbled themselves, I will not destroy them, but will soon give them deliverance. My wrath will not be poured out on Jerusalem through Shishak. They will, however, become subject to him, so that they may learn the difference between serving me and serving the kings of other lands. When Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem, he carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord and the treasures of the royal palaces. He took everything, including the gold shields Solomon had made. So King Rehoboam made bronze shields to replace them and assigned these, assigned these to the commanders of the guard on duty at the entrance to the royal palace. Whenever the king went to the Lord's temple, the guards went with him bearing the shields and afterward they would return them to the guard room. Because Rehoboam humbled himself, the Lord's anger turned from him and he was not totally destroyed. Indeed, there was some good in Judah. So King Rehoboam established himself firmly in Jerusalem and continued as king. He was 41 years old when he became king and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city of the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel in which to put his name. His mother's name was Neymar and she was an Ammonite. He did evil things because he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. As for the events of Rehoboam's reign, from beginning to end, are they not written in the records of Shemaiah the prophet and of Iddo the seer that deal with genealogies? There, were continual, there, were conti- there was continual warfare between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Rehoboam resist- rested with his father and was buried in the city of David, and Abijah, his son, succeeded him as king. The announcement. Right? I'm going to use um, make one anyway. Evening, Happy New Year, 2024. We've all made it. We're not in lockdown, isn't it, like the last time? <laughs> or the in and out of lockdowns, wasn't it? In, out. But praise God, we're out of it now. Um, okay, we're in uh, 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles is the book that we're uh, looking through, RBT, reading the Bible together. Um, and we're looking at this passage in chapter 12, um, Rehoboam. And first, I'd like to say... Um, He's not a good example, Rehoboam. He's really not a good example. And I want to just stress tonight 
the reason God gives this word tonight is because he doesn't want you to be in that place. You see, his chapter has already been written. That's the problem with Rehoboam. His chapter has already been written. Your chapter is being written right now. And at any point of your life, any moment, you can begin to just say, I'm going to start seeking the Lord. Already as a Christian, you'll be seeking the Lord, but there'll be a measure of it. There'll be a measure of seeking the Lord. And I don't think you can get more, I don't think you could um, seek the Lord too much. There's not such a thing as seeking the Lord too much. So maybe the Lord has sent you, maybe, if the, maybe the Lord sent you this evening, and if you're already seeking the Lord, maybe the Lord said, no, come and seek me more. Come and call upon my, more, call upon my name more in your life. But Rehoboam, as was read there, he did evil because he did not seek the Lord. So really, the, the title of the message, I think it will come up here, um, if it, the next slide, but, um, is really set your hearts to, to seek the Lord. And basically, it's, yeah, it is. That's really what the message is tonight. Just set your heart. Whatever you are, you don't have to be in the best place. Sometimes you think, I'll be in a good place to set my heart. In fact, most of the time, you're just going to be in a broken place. Um, but you just make a decision. I'm going to start seeking the Lord um, in whatever situation that is. So let's pray together and ask the Lord for his help. Father God, Lord, I ask you, Lord, that this, first of all, Lord, I ask you that this word would come forth clearly as it should, that the words would not be mistaken. If there are any words that are mistaken, Lord, that you would correct them in their hearts, Lord God. Lord, and if they are mistaken, Lord, it, it, let it be not because of your word, but because of our own hearts trying to twist what gets said. Lord God, I ask you, for, uh, Father, also that the words would penetrate our hearts. Lord, whatever stubbornness or hardness of heart that we have, Lord, help us to know that you're not speaking us to to beat us down. You're speaking to us because you love us so much, Lord God. You care for us so much, Lord God, and you want to bring uh, your love and your help into our lives, Lord, but help us to make a decision to seek you, Lord. And I pray also, Father, Lord, I ask you this evening that, that from this day, Lord, we would just make a decision, Lord God, just to seek you, Lord, whether that's in the morning time, hopefully most likely in the morning time, Lord God, because that's the time where it's best to do before the day starts, Lord, but we'd make that time, Lord God. If our schedule's too busy to seek you, Lord, we change our schedule, Lord God. We make, make sure that we do it, Lord. We make sure that we're seeking you, Lord. Even, but even when we're working in the workplace, that our hearts would be continually seeking you and, and looking to you and asking for your help. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I'll just I'll do a quick recap of Rehoboam. So obviously Rehoboam is Solomon's son, King Solomon. And his heart, King Solomon's heart, um, he didn't really seek the Lord at the end of his life. His heart was basically divided a thousand times. And that's because he, he married the wrong woman. And he, had, he said they had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And basically what happened is as he got older, as he got weaker, it, they turned his heart away from the Lord. And so I, I kind of picture Solomon, in my mind, is like his heart gets divided a thousand times. And it's so hard to seek the Lord if your heart has been divided, if you've got so many other devotions a thousand times. And then his son is Rehoboam, and he succeeds him as king, and you see that in chapter 10. And, but in Rehoboam's time, the kingdom is going to be split. So you're going to have Judah and Israel, um, are going to split. Um, and there's two tribes, I think, goes to Rehoboam, and there's going to be 10 tribes go to another person, another king called Jeroboam. And Rehoboam, he gets this, this chance just as he becomes king. So he becomes king in chapter 10, and then in verse 8, he gets this opportunity to do something, to make a godly decision, if I would call it that. There's an opportunity to make a godly decision, but he makes the wrong decision. And that, there's two parts to that decision. What Part of the decision was, you've got a choice, um, Rehoboam. The people came to Rehoboam, the, the, the church came to him and said, look, lighten the load. Your father Solomon put a heavy load on, on top of us. And I think it wasn't just the fact that they, Solomon built a temple and built a palace. I think it was the fact that Solomon um, had, had the, such division in his heart that it brought a heavy load onto the people. And, and they said to Rehoboam, basically, are you gonna be the same? Are you going, please lighten the load on us. And Rehoboam took, went to two different people for advice. And this, is, this can be our problem. He went to the elders. He went to godly people. So imagine that. That's godly people in your life. And the godly people sp spoke to um, Rehoboam and says, be kind to them. 
Even though they're subject to you, even though you're, you're in charge, be, be kind to them and they'll serve you. But he didn't do that. He went to the people that he grew up with. And how many of you know that's a bad mistake? Just the people that you hang around with, maybe not interested in God as much. And he asked them, what's your advice? Basically, he said to him, you're king, you just treat him harshly. And he, said, he had this phrase that I'm going to treat you, I'm going to sting you with scorpions. Could you imagine being under that leadership? If you step out line, I'm going to sting you with a scorpion. Who would want to be under that? And that's what happened there. So he, he took the wrong advice. Was he going to be kind or was he going to be tough and just be harshly? And he chose to be tough and harshly. And it split the kingdom. The 10 tribes says, we're not even, we don't even have a share in King David's kingdom anymore. We're splitting away from you. Um, and the kingdom split, and there's two different kingdoms. And then Rehoboam, on top of that, he decides to make war against the other kingdom. So there's Judah and Israel, and Rehoboam says, right, we're going to get an army, and we're going to attack you. And church life can be like that. You can see it with denominations, can you? Two denominations. Oh, you split away from me. And then they, they fight each other. It's the wrong battle. And the Lord intervenes and basically says, don't go and fight your brothers. And that's a good one for this morning, isn't it? Don't fight your brothers, isn't it? I heard one pastor say, sheep don't fight sheep. You're in a spiritual battle. You don't fight the people next to you, even if they're struggling in a sin. You don't fight them. But he went to fight him, and God spoke to Rehoboam and said, don't, don't do it. And guess what? He listened to the word of the Lord. And so there was these unctions in his life where he listened. But you, and you think that he would get on a good path, but ultimately he doesn't get on a good path. But it says he goes through this good spell. So we'll, we'll, he goes through this good moment, this good season. So what happened? Rehoboam decides not to make war against his brothers. And instead, he starts to invest in the kingdom. It says that he built towns and he built fortified cities. And he made them very strong. He said, if, in fact, he had 16 cities. And I mean, they were, he says, they were, all, they were very strong cities. And he supplied all those cities with shields and oil and wine and, um, and grain. And basically, and it says all of them were, were really strong. And on top of that, it says that the Levites and the priests came and joined Rehoboam. So almost like it's reversing. And it, and it says the Levites and the priests that were in Israel joined Judah, which had Jerusalem. And it says that the Levites and the priests were even willing to give up their homes and their land and their pro, uh, the, the part of their property to come and join Rehoboam. And the reason they'd done that, because although Rehoboam was bad, Jeroboam, king of Israel, was worse. And I think, I think you're going to see that in this generation, that there's going to be denominations, that they might leave one denomination because it gets bad. It might not be that ours is necessarily good, but it's just that it's worse than that one at the moment. And they come and they join us. And it says not only that, that other people in Israel decided to join Rehoboam. And it was, the, it's noted that the people that decided to join him were all people who set their heart on seeking the Lord. So anybody who wanted to seek the Lord said, I'm going to go to Rehoboam, we're going to go to Jerusalem. And um, it says because of that, because the people in the kingdom were seeking the Lord, it strengthened. That's where the kingdom got its strength from. And Rehoboam, even though he's king, um, you know, think of it, he, he was a man that had people turn away and all of a sudden people are receiving him again and the kingdom gets, he gets strengthened because of that. And you'd think when he sees that strength, what does he do? You know, once, he, once he's finally got strong, because there's a moment he wasn't getting strong and it says there, in this is where we get in at chapter 12, it says, after Rehoboam's position of king was established and he'd become strong and look at this, he, not just he, but all Israel, that would include the ones that were seeking for, with him abandoned the law of the Lord. So he gets strong, and guess what he does? He just abandons the Lord. You would maybe think it was the opposite moment, that when you abandon the Lord, but it says that it's actually when he's, he's really strong. He must have looked out and seen the people obeying. He must have looked at these cities, um, and it says that even in, in chapter 11, it talks about, he appoint, appointed ch a chief prince over those cities and there was making wise decisions. He gave them abundant provisions and uh, etc. And so the, he, he must have looked at all this strength and he does this ridiculous thing and thinks, I'm going to abandon the Lord. 
And you, you think of that in church life. You see it in church life. I've seen it. Matt would have seen it. You do Bible studies with somebody. They're in their most desperation. You do some Bible studies, and they're, they're encouraged. And all, all of a sudden, they feel strong and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that, that Bible study. I'm not going to have them as much. Think about it with, with praying. Think about it with church services. Think about it with fellowship. You maybe think, why did they, why did they go? Well, the Bible is saying sometimes it's because they became strong. And there's, a li- there's going to be a lifelong lesson, hopefully not lifelong, hopefully you're going to learn it in the lifetime. And God is going to teach Rehoboam a lesson um, that when you get strong, don't abandon me. And you're going to see the difference of what it looks like. And he has to go through this um, lesson. And, and it's a horrible word, is that abandon? I don't know if you've ever abandoned anything. I know I've, I've abandoned my, I had a bicycle once and it was broken and the chain kept coming off and I just like threw it. And you probably, you know, and sometimes you abandon someone and you say, where did you leave it? You're like, you don't even know where you left it. And some people can be like that with the Lord. Where did you leave it? Where, where did it all of a sudden go? You were seeking him. You were calling upon his name. He, he was the very one that bought, brought the strength in the first place. And yet when you, you do this wrong connection, the strength is there. And then you think, oh, I'll, I'll take my foot off the gas now. I'll stop seeking him. I prayed a lot. So I've got, I've got like, t- I'm topped up, you know. You almost feel like I'm topped up in prayer now. And I'll go through the credit. And it was, it was a wrong mindset in the first place. It was a faulty mindset. And God has to fix that, that in our hearts. And it'd be, for example, it would be like this church getting filled with people, filled with ministries, and all of that being fruitful. And then all of a sudden, sorry, let's stop seeking the Lord as much. Because we've, we've got what we've desired. That's what we desired. We desired for it to be filled. We desired for it to have ministries. We desired to be fruitful. So we'll, we'll hold off now seeking the Lord because we've already got what we desired. There's something wrong then, isn't there? There's something wrong inside of the heart. And you, you got to be careful when you get strong. And it says, after Rehoboam's position was, as king was established. And that word established means you've done something for a long time. You, you've, um, you're settled. It wasn't when he just f- first started. He, he wasn't willing to just abandon when he first started. He made a bad choice when he first started, but he didn't say he abandoned. And it even said that he, he listened to the Lord. He wouldn't go fight his brothers. And then he became, he became strong. And then it, he just abandons everything. And the whole of Israel, not just him, the whole of Israel just abandons the Lord. I, I, wonder, I often think, like, what would it, I, well, I'm thinking now, what would it have looked like to abandon? What would it have looked like amongst the people that they would abandon the Lord? They were God's people. They were in Jerusalem where God's name was. But there was just something about them that wasn't connected with the Lord anymore. And it's interesting, as I said, seeking the Lord brings in strength. Seeking is when you sought him, the strength came, but yet now you're strong, you're abandoned. And it's like a big question, but why, why does that happen? Why do I get strong? I'm not weak anymore. I feel, I, you know, there's things improve inside of my life. Maybe for you, it's your, your mind has become clearer. You, become, you know, you feel the peace of God. You feel the joy of God. You feel your sins are forgiven. And if at any time to think, right, I'm going to abandon, you think it shouldn't be that time, is it? Um, but that's what he does. And I think there's a lesson, um, you know, in Deuteronomy, blessings come with warning. When you're blessed, it comes with, it comes with a warning. And it comes with warnings of pride. And I don't know about you, sometimes, like for me, at Christmas time, sometimes giving kids presents at Christmas is, is tough for them. They don't know how to handle the blessing. They don't know how to respond. They know how to respond when they don't get the presents. They talk about the presents all the time. What am I going to get? What thing am I going to get, etc. But when you begin to put the presents into their life, it, it, is, it is danger, isn't it? It's a danger zone. And the Bible's... Jesus warns us before this even happens. He wants to bring blessing into your life. Trust me, he really wants to bring blessing in your life. But he doesn't want you to get confused and, and make you get disconnected. Um, there's a verse in Deuteronomy 32. It says, Jeshurun, which is the church, Israel. Israel grew fat and kicked. Filled with food, they became heavy and sleek. They abandoned the God who made them and rejected the rock, their savior. So there's quite a, a bit in there, but basically it says they became fat. And actually, if you read Leviticus, 
Two things were, were burnt on the altar, and one of them was fat. <laughs> I'm not saying like your literal fat, it's spiritual fatness. And actually, you, in, when you get blessed, that, that fat, should, you shouldn't be getting fat. So basically, they're taking the blessing, I would imagine like this, isn't it? They're taking the blessing and they're putting it in the wrong place. You know, that's what you do with food, isn't it? You, it goes in the wrong place and it doesn't come off. And you, you get bigger and bigger and you get heavy and you get misjudgment, etc. I'm not saying heavy people are misjudgment, but you know what I mean, spiritually. Um, but actually, the, the fat was to be burned in the altar. And what's meant to happen, this is what's meant to happen. And fat represents the pride. It just represents you thinking you can do all by yourself, all by yourself. And it's basically this, all pride and thinking we can do things in our own strength is to be destroyed at the cross. Is that, and it's a sign that it's not been destroyed yet. You, there's still a, a part of you who thinks, I can do this by myself. There's still a part of you that is that's prideful and saying, do you know what, I, I, I'll, I'll take the foot off the gas and I won't seek the Lord like I have been at this moment. And it's, it's a sign that we've, you've not let the, the fat, as it were, been burned at the cross and saying, right, I can't do this myself. Even when I'm blessed, I still can't do it. I, I know I need him. I'm not going to look at the blessings. They're amazing. And I'll rejoice at them. And that's what actually, the Bible says that when you get blessed, what should you do then? You shouldn't be proud. Basically, the Bible says when you're blessed, just turn it into praise. Just praise the Lord. Just praise him and thank him and see his goodness. And that's why when things are going strong, you don't say, I, I'll stop coming to church. You say, when things are going strong, you say, I'm going to, because you think, well, I feel strong now, so I won't go. I'll come back when I'm weak, and I'll get a top up. No, that's not what's going to happen. When you feel strong, you say, I'm going to go back, because I'm going to go back and praise the Lord. And I'm going to see him more and more of, of, his, of his goodness, etc. It says, and this is the warning that we get in Deuteronomy. When you have eaten and then satisfied, that's the, mo that's the moment. It's not saying when you're hungry. It says, actually, when you're satisfied, Praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. And what basically it's saying this, when you feel good, not when you feel, when you feel good, don't forget Jesus. Don't, for, don't forget him. Keep remembering. Remember, remember who it was that caused you to feel good. You so say when you're satisfied, and it says, because what happens when you're, you're satisfied, you're in a, it's a good moment, but you're also, actually also in a danger zone of pride. And you're in danger of starting to say to yourself, I can do this myself. You're in danger that you forget how much the Lord has done for you. You can still remember what the Lord has done with you with a full belly, you know. But there's a danger that you start to just, you, you, you switch off as it were. And actually God said, when you're in blessing, just be, be careful. Tread it carefully. Keep watching your heart. Am I, am I looking to him? Am I seeking him? And they forget how much the Lord has done for you. And he goes on to say, remember, when you're filled, when you're feeling good, remember you were slaves. You might think, I don't want to remember I was a slave when I'm feeling good. But actually, it's, it's for your own good. Remember that he found you at your lowest. You maybe feel good today because his blessing is upon you and he's giving you peace and he's giving you joy and he's giving you hope. But if, and I think if you remember you were a slave, remember that he found you at your lowest and you kind of just do the dot to dot and you just connect it and it says, remember Egypt. Oh, but I feel good. No, but it said, just please remember Egypt when you feel good. When you feel good, remember the Red Sea when you couldn't get past the, remember the Red Sea, you could not get past and Pharaoh is chasing behind you and there's, there's, there's death in front of you, there's death behind you and there's no way out. And all there is is looking to the Lord and he opens the Red Sea. And he said, remember that. Because as you remember that, you're, it's going to be able to, you're going to be able to praise the Lord in those moments. Um, and he's saying, check. Basically, he's saying this. Check your hearts when the blessings come. And just, it, it, I think it sums up in this. Just stay close to Jesus. Stay close to him. Because actually, it can be a dangerous zone. When I feel strong, well, I, I won't come because I feel strong. I won't because I, because I feel I've got this now. I've got, and actually, it's, it should actually make us closer to Jesus. God doesn't want the blessing to make you drive away. But maybe you ever thought he withholds it because he knows that's what will happen? That he gives you, and all of a sudden you just abandon? He's saying, I want you to stay close. I want you to, to make that connection. And, 
And when we don't, he, he's going to bring a lesson into our lives. And what you, when you read this lesson, we'll, you'll all feel like that. Rehoboam doesn't going to, is not going to learn the lesson. God is going to be merciful to him because he abandons the Lord. And God is going to then teach him a lesson, to basically like a spot the difference lesson. But yet Rehoboam's still not going to learn it. It says this, because they've been, verse 2, because they've been unfaithful to the Lord, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam with 12,000 1,200 chariots and 60,000 horsemen and innumerable troops of Libyan, Sukites, Cushites that came from Egypt. He captured the fortified cities of Judah and came as far as Jerusalem. And then it says in verse 5, Then the prophet Shemai came to Rehoboam and to the leaders of Judah who assembled in Jerusalem for fear of Shishak. And he said to them, This is what the Lord says. You have abandoned me, therefore I now abandon you to Shishak. So God basically says to Rehoboam, that's it, it's finished. You're going to be destroyed. But it, it doesn't happen that way. Actually, it says, the leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, the Lord is just. When the Lord saw that they had humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemai. Since they have humbled themselves, I will not destroy them, but will soon give them deliverance. My wrath will not be poured out on Jerusalem through Shishak. They will, have, they will, however, be subject to him, and this is the spot, the difference, this is the lesson, so that they may learn the difference between serving me and serving the kings of the other lands. So God basically says to Rehoboam, okay, I'm gonna, you, wanna, you wanna turn away from me, you wanna turn your back on me, I'm gonna, t I'm, I'm gonna abandon you, I'm gonna leave you to it, isn't it? It's the worst thing that can happen. If you say you want your sin so much, we all struggle with sin. But you know, there's a, sometimes there's a sin that is, is going to wreck you and, God, and you want it so much. The worst thing that can happen to you is God say, okay, I'll give you over to it. But actually, Rehoboam basically says, you know what, the, the Lord is just. I know I'm doing wrong. In other words, he's saying like, I know I keep doing that. I, I get strong and then I abandon the Lord. And the Lord is just in pronouncing the judgment. He knows what I'm like. Um, and it, it came to that place, isn't it, that what happened is... is he, they've been unfaithful to the Lord. The Lord sent a big army to them. And it says that there was 1,200 chariots, 60,000 soldiers, and um, like countless, num countless number of other soldiers. And it says there that they, they, fought, they took over these strong cities and they're right, on, right to Jerusalem. And what is this picture of us? It's like when, when you get involved in sin, if you get involved in the wrong relationship, addictions, or sinful living, you always feel fine until the consequence bite. And the places that you were strong in, they're, they're conquered. And Jerusalem re represents the very core of you. Next to you is the very core of you. And when the very core of you starts getting threatened, it, 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 is, it is that moment in that time where you think, I need to turn back to the Lord here. This is not, this is not going the way that I wanted it to go. Um, and the, he humbles himself, and they humble themselves before the Lord, and God says, okay, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to destroy you now. But I am going to make you subject to him, to the king of Egypt, so that you're going to learn a lesson, the difference between serving me and serving this, um, this other king. In other words, you're going, to have to learn the, you're going to have to learn the lesson of what it's like to serve the Lord or serve your sin. And, notice, and basically, saying, I want you to notice the difference. And it should bring in you a real heart to seek the Lord. And God allows this lesson um, f for them. It says in Proverbs 131, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their own schemes. And in this lesson, you need to learn a lesson. I call it the, the strong and abandoned lesson. You get strong and you abandon. You get strong and you abandon. Where have you gone? And you, you know in your own heart, don't you? Why, do, why is it when I get strong, I just think I can do it myself, everything's going to be fine, um, and it's not going to be fine. And so God brings a lesson into the church there and see if you can identify with this. You will, in, in your own way, identify with this. It says there, um, if I can read it. Yeah. I'll read it from the verse here. Okay, so he says, verse 8, they will, however, become subject to him so they may learn the difference between serving me and serving the kings of the other lands. When Shishak king, so this is now going to be the lesson. So you, 
Egypt was going to come in and destroy them. God said, I'm not going to let them destroy you, but there's going to be this moment where they're going to have, you're going to be subject to them. You're going to taste what it's like being under Egypt. It says, when Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem, he carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord and the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including the gold shields of Solomon had made. So King Rehoboam made bronze shields to replace them and assigned them to the commanders of the guards on duty of the entrance to the royal palace. Whenever the king went to the Lord's temple, the guards went with him, bearing the shields. And afterwards, they, they returned them to the guard room. So basically, they, if you, re, you read it, there was 200 gold shields, big, large gold shields that Solomon had made. And there was 300 actually little shields. shields. And every one of those shields, if you read it, is, is 6.9 kilograms every one of those large shields. And there's 200 of them. And, and it says there, and there was these 300 small shields which were 1.7 kilograms around as well. Not only that, they were in the palace. They were a representation of in one way God's blessing at that moment. But also all the treasure out of the temple was going to be taken away. It was taken away, all the gold. Um, and then, so what he does, Rehoboam, instead of that, he makes bronze shields. And every time he's going to go up to the Lord's temple, he's going to have these people with bronze shields next to him. And they're, and they're going to have to all be guarded. And when they get guarded, they've got to go and put all the bronze shields back. And God said, I want you to see the difference. Spot, what's the difference? And don't, don't get it wrong when you read this about, you know, well, God's not into gold. And God doesn't care about gold in this temple, etc., when you went into the temple, there was two things that were very visible, very, very visible. And it was blood and it was, the, was gold. And God, the, that gold was actually represented. The people brought that treasure to, to set up this temple and it was preaching to you something about Christ. It wasn't that God was into gold. What, the gold represents God's, it was to represent the new life that was to come from Christ. It was to represent the blessing of God. There was going to be this blood, this, this blood sacrifice that Jesus has given you. And around it, God is saying it, it was to represent ultimately the treasures of heaven and the riches of Christ. It wasn't that God was into currency and gold and etc. He, but he's into new life. He's into this knowing the treasures and the, and the life of God. And when this, when Rehoboam made this decision where he's going to get strong and then he abandons, God said, God, I want you to spot the difference. And the difference is going to be this in your life. You're going to have the blood, but you won't have the treasure. It won't, it, you won't treasure it like you used to. Your sin will mar it. Your sin will affect it. We're all going to struggle with sin. But if you get strong and you abandon, you're going to see all the blood, but you're, never, you're not going to see the treasure that is around that. All the treasures that the temple was took in. And not only that, you're going to have to have this, this bronze shield and they're going to be brought up to the temple. And you're going to, it's, I, I call it, like, it's like a bronze shield experience of Christ. The blood's still there. What God has done is still, you, 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 the value of it has been taken away in your life. And God's saying, you, you're going to see the difference. He, the devil is going to make you have that experience. There was, no, there was no treasure around it. There was no, and remember, when Solomon built that temple, he was, it was prescribed to him. The pattern was prescribed to him how to build it. And it was, it was symbolic. So you would have the sacrifice. And you wouldn't have the sacrifice in just in that, that place. It, there was this, there was this um, gold, you would see it. There was this gold artwork with fruit around it. And it was all representing something. It's basically saying, look who has died for you. The divineness. God in flesh has died for you. This is, represents heaven and who heaven is. And, and, then, and then it becomes disjointed, doesn't it? You, he's going to church, but you, imagine like going into the temple and you've seen the blood, but you don't see heaven behind it. You go to the temple, you see Christ, but you don't see God behind Christ. You don't see God, um, the goodness of God in all of it. You don't see heaven being connected. Um, and the, the, the devil wants you to have that experience. How many times the backsliders say, when somebody backslides, they say, my experience is different? Or they get involved in a sin, like adultery, or um, for young people, it could be sexual sins, pornography. The, the experience has changed. And God said, I want you to see the difference. You can be in the same room, the same place, but where's the treasure? Why don't I treasure them? Why, why is that? Why is that? And ultimately, what God was saying to Rehoboam, seek me again. Don't abandon me. Don't get strong and abandon me. 
And that treasure is seeing the character and the new life connected to the sacrifice. And it says there, um, because Rehoboam humbled himself, the Lord's anger turned from him and he was not totally destroyed. Indeed, there was some good in Judah. King Rehoboam established himself firmly in Jerusalem and continued as king. He was 41 years old when he became king and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city of the Lord had chosen out of Israel. And in verse 14, he did evil because he had not set his heart on, um, on, on seeking the Lord. And it's saying this, he doesn't learn the lesson. He does not learn the lesson. He said, I've got to begin to, I've got to, begin to seek the Lord. Um, I remember a moment from my own experience. I first became a Christian. And I tell you, seeking the Lord is life and death experience. I first became a Christian. I was about to make a decision that was going to bring death to me. It really was going to bring death to me. And I remember just as I was about to go into that room to, to face death, as it were, a, a guy handed me a little piece of paper. And on that piece of paper, it says, do not dare turn your back on God. But if you turn to Jesus, he's faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you um, from all unrighteousness. And that's what God wants you to do. Don't be, your chapter's not finished. You have a moment to say, I'm going to seek him. I'm going to, you, it's your choice. Just say, I'm going to set my heart to, to seek the Lord. It starts with just saying, Lord, forgive me. Lord, I want to turn away from all the sin that I've been doing and I want to turn toward you. Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Lord, I want you in my life. What, you know, how, how do you describe seeking the Lord? The people you see in the Bible, ultimately, God is speaking to you and he's saying, seek me. Whatever way, in the, the best way you know how, just begin to seek him. Maybe it's reading your Bible, maybe it's praying, maybe it's fellowship, maybe it's coming to church and say, I'm going to set my heart. And God asks you to do that. You, you set your heart to seek him. Um, and you know that's, that was the difference with, with David, isn't it? And the, you know, see, I, I don't want you to be like Rehoboam. You don't want to be like Rehoboam. You get strong and you abandon. It wasn't the purpose to seek him and want it way to get strong, wasn't it? The purpose to seek him was to know him. And the Bible says that when you seek him, you're going to find him. When you seek him, he's, the Lord is going to give you direction. And when you seek him, he's going to start bringing the joy back into your life. And he's going to start showing you this amazing work of Jesus. It was more than just getting strong. It, it, was, it was about God bringing meaning and purpose into your life. And the Lord... Um, strength coming into your life. And what happens if when you begin to seek Jesus, guess what's going to happen? The treasure will be restored. You're not going to treasure just, you know, because that's Ray, Ray was just treasuring maybe the things in church. But when he seek the Lord, he, he, the treasure was restored. Let me just read Psalm 40 to finish with. It says this. May, Psalm 40 verse 16. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say the Lord is great. May you always say he is great. May you always see, he wants you to see his greatness. He wants you to see his help, his saving power. If, it, if it's just become a bronze shield experience for you, there's a sign, isn't it? I've got to get back and seek. I've got to seek him. It's got to become a treasure. It's got to become life. It's got to become hope. That's not because you're making it. That is who he is. I see the goodness of God. I see his, his goodness. I see that he's good, that there's no sin inside of him, yet he's died for me. I see his love. I see his peace. I see his plan unfolding before me that he's going to deal with all the wickedness and he's going to save the righteous and he's going to bring the new heavens and the new earth. I see that. I see how he loves. I see how he saves. I see how he rescues the broken. What is his plan now? I can see that his plan now is to rescue the broken and the heart and the hurt and to save them now. That is his plan right now, to save those who are lost. And he's setting up his kingdom. I see all that. The treasure begins to be restored. I see that when Jesus Christ has died, what that means, it means I'm forgiven, that there's new life. There's access to God by, the, by his spirit to, to the Father. I have a relationship with God. And that I'm, I'm righteous before his sight. The song begins to be put back into your heart. The joy begins to put back into your heart. The vision gets put back into your eyes. The treasure, the treasure begins, you begin to see it. Now, what is that treasure? Like I say, it wasn't the gold. Is what it was representing. God's life and love to you in Jesus. And you begin to see that. And that begins to be restored. Until then, sometimes there's a lesson. You want your sin, okay, let's, 
have your sin with that experience in that sense. You want to keep going that way? And you say, what's the difference here? When I seek the Lord, I start to have my eyes open in this treasure. When I, when I do things my own way, it's a, it's a rubbish experience, isn't it? It really is a rubbish experience. And God said, I want to restore that in your life. But it's going to just, you just set your heart to seek me. Seek me. Just seek me. Begin to call upon my name. Begin to look to me. Begin to wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going to ask him into my life. He'll, he'll begin to speak to you. He'll begin to lead you. He'll begin to guide you. And he'll give you vision that you've never had before. He'll give you life that you've, you've never experienced before. He'll give you love that you've, that you've never fully maybe tasted. And you'll begin to see how wide is that love. You can't measure it. He asks you to measure it. You can't, keep, you can't measure it because it keeps going on. How high is that love? You imagine the bronze shield experience. How wide is the love of God? Well, it doesn't feel very wide. But when it, the, the temple and everything is set as it is, and the worship and everything is set as it is, as you're seeking your heart as it is and should be, well then, what's, what's stopping the Lord then, isn't it? What's stopping and beginning to restore inside of you that treasure of Jesus, that you love him, and, you, and he loves you. He loves you so, so much. So let's just, it, the, the challenge is to, tonight is, will you set your heart? Will you set your heart? God's not asking to ask the person next to you. He is asking the person next to you. He's not asking you if everything's going fine and then you'll do it. He's asking you now, where you are, whatever the situation, will you just set your heart to seek him? He'll do all the restoring. Or you just want to keep, or do you want to just stay in the lesson, the spot, the difference lesson? He wants you to, he doesn't want you, he wants you to be out that lesson and saying, right, I want you to know what it is to know my love and peace and joy. But it comes from us setting our hearts and seeking him. So let's pray together. Father God, please help us as we go into 2024 to set our hearts to seek you. Lord God, we just thank you, Lord God, that you seek us, Lord God. You come to seek and save the lost, Lord God. Please help us, Lord God, this year to, to seek you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I just say that one seeking God, it's it's the reverse of hide and seek. Hide and seek, you you um, hide and God seeks you. Well, the reverse of hide and seek is you're the one hiding. Just come out of your hiding and just say I'm there, Lord. So if you, I help you. Let's. Ready to sing. sought the
And if we can raise our hands and just remember what Jesus has said, and I'm going to read those verses from Psalm 40. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation always say, the Lord be exalted. Amen.